So, um, in these three lectures, so we are going to cover uh, a good introduction to Higgs phenomenology and Higgs physics. Of course, uh, it's we need to limit the scope because it's a huge field. Uh, if we want to go into all possible aspects of it uh, and look at uh, the role of uh, electroweak symmetry breaking and how electroweak weak symmetry breaking is realized in many different models, so we have really to limit this to just what we want to discuss. So um, it's clear, however, let me at least be general in the introduction, so bef before we narrow down to the specific of what we want to discuss. Clearly, the problem of, uh, so electroweak symmetry in its realization uh, has been studied uh, for the past 30 years in gory detail, and there is no doubt up to as of today, that uh, at the electroweak scale, it is the theory that describes the interaction of elementary particles. However, at the same time, uh, because we have studied it so thoroughly and so well, and because of any, many other indications that we do have from other fields outside high energy physics, uh, we know that it is an effective theory, that is the theory of an elementary particle interaction at the electroweak scale, but not much far beyond that. And therefore, nowadays that we are at the point of uh, really testing our ideas uh, to go beyond the standard model, to try to understand uh, and to complete the standard model in the ultraviolet region, it is uh, crucial to answer the question of what is the realization of electroweak symmetry breaking. We know that the electroweak symmetry is broken. We know that uh, the gauge boson of the electroweak force are massive. And uh, that has to be explained, right? And any physics beyond the standard model has these as uh, question number one, right? So how the electroweak symmetry breaking is realized. Now, the most probably economic way of realizing uh, the breaking of the electroweak symmetry is precisely through the Higgs mechanism that we will discuss in these lectures, which is a sort of uh, assumed uh, as part of the standard model, probably because it's uh, the simplest possible way in which we can uh, achieve uh, this uh, goal, and the most economical one, the one for which we introduce the least of parameters, and we can therefore try to constrain whatever predictions come out of that to, to our best. So <clears throat> this is precisely what we are going to discuss in this lecture. So it will mainly be standard model oriented, just because uh, if you look at the program of the Tevatron and you look at the program of the LHC, this is top priority number one. And rightly so, for the reason that I just said. Because we need to answer this question and you don't want to start from where you don't know how to constrain because you don't have information enough. So you want to start from something you know really, really, really well and it has a very limited uh, arbitrariness uh, involved into it because of two reasons. That well, if it's true, it's very simple, nice, right? If it's not true and we don't find a Higgs as described in the simplest possible realization that is embedded in the standard model, excellent. We have disproven it. And at the same time, we have played an extremely useful exercise of using the physics of the Tevatron and the physics of the LHC to find or do not find it, so to prove or disprove uh, new physics with the simplest possible extension. So in both ways, uh, depending on which uh, mood you feel like, uh, so if you feel like uh, we are going to see one, or we are not going to see one, or we are going to see something similar or something else, it's in any case uh, the place where you want to start from. And that's the reason why it is uh, at the core of the experimental program of both the colliders we have, uh, both the one that is winding down and the one that is ramping up. Okay? So, <coughs> We uh, therefore want to move straight to, after having introduced you so generally to the fact that electrosymmetry breaking is so important, let's focus on this uh, most economical way of realizing the breaking of the electroweak symmetry. And we will go back to other possibilities uh, while we discuss the phenomenology of the standard model Higgs boson and uh, the realization of the Higgs mechanism within the standard model. So the idea that uh, is uh, um, uh, at the basis uh, of the Higgs mechanism as it is uh, realized in the standard model goes back to uh, some very general other idea that uh, was born uh, before even the standard model itself and it just has to, to do with the possibility of realizing a symmetry at the level of the Lagrangian uh, 
but not at the level of the ground state of the symmetry or at the level of uh, the true spectrum of the symmetry. So this is something that uh, is very, very, very general and is something very useful because uh, you do not necessarily want a symmetric word. It would be very boring, probably. But you may want a symmetric Lagrangian because uh, it's nice to work with a symmetric object. So the fact that you still may have a symmetric Lagrangian but uh, with a rich physics content, uh, it's a really nice uh, feature of your theory. So the idea of how to do that and the idea of uh, how we can uh, have something that looks simpler, looks simple, but uh, is indeed much more interesting than we think, uh, is uh, let's kind of build it up in, in steps uh, from something very, very simple to something that uh, somehow involves more and more and more degrees of freedom. The simplest possible case you can think of is uh, classical mechanics, right? So really, really, really simple. You just take uh, just uh, one degree of freedom uh, and you write down uh, first uh, the harmonic oscillator, then uh, the unharmonic oscillator, and then uh, you flip the sign uh, of one of the terms. Uh, and you have done this exercise, I'm sure, right, uh, in, your, in your physics classes. Uh, so if you start, uh, I won't even try to write up there, but <coughs> if you start from something from a Lagrangian, so just in... Uh, D equal one, right, just one object. So you start with the Lagrangian that is just the kinetic term. And then uh, normally for an harmonic oscillator you would write uh, minus a half k q square. And then for an anharmonic one you would keep going with another term that uh, to use already the name of the coupling that we're gonna use later on, uh, we would write it like this. And this has a potential uh, that clearly start uh, with uh, the canonical Q equals zero minimum. But then you flip the sign of this object and you write it as plus a half KQ square. And then all of a sudden uh, you're looking at the potential that instead of being of this form uh, in its Q, V of Q plane uh, is uh, of this form. And it's a simple exercise to see that. And it now doesn't have a minimum at Q equals zero, but it has a minimum at plus V and minus V. So it has two minima. And the, clearly the Lagrangian uh, that you wrote down is invariant for Q going into minus Q. So it's invariant by reflection, right? It's invariant by inversion of Q. And uh, your theory will have to be developed as an expansion about the minimum of the theory, and the minimum of the theory will be either a plus V or a minus V, as soon as you choose that, uh, your symmetry of reflection is uh, broken, right? so you don't have it anymore. Now, <coughs> you go to quantum mechanics, uh, and it's very much the same, except for the fact uh, that there is an important difference, uh, which is the fact that you can tunnel between the two. Right? So you don't have to break necessarily this. You will, you will say that you have a sort of a half prob equal probability of being here and being there. You go to quantum field theory, well, sorry, you go to field theory, classical field theory, and the simplest thing that you can do is just to replace this Q with a phi. Now, it's a big difference, though, because you're replacing one object with uh, you know, a continuum of things. But the simplest thing that you can do is just to replace your Q with a phi of x, right? and write down a scalar Lagrange. Right? You write down a scalar Lagrangian and you see very much the same thing, right? So let me write it behind you. <coughs> so you write down your Lagrangian L and imagine even that you're even more general than this and take even a family of scalar fields. So a vector between quotation mark of scalar fields that has component phi i, so a collection of scalar fields. And you write the Lagrangian now, that will be a Lagrangian of the form a half the mu phi square, where u phi is the, oops, the vector that I wrote over there. Then you have a mass term. Now the mass term, how would you write it down? If you had to write just a traditional scalar theory, you would write something like this. And if you want to make it interacting, and, and then you write the Klein-Gordon theory, then you make it interacting, and you add, you add the interaction that you like. Let's pick the one that we are going to use, which is the phi to the fourth. So you write something that is of the form minus lambda over four, or four factorial, whatever you like. I use four, phi to the fourth. Or if you want this phi to the fourth, it's a phi square square, right? And just so that how we mean it. <coughs> and uh, this is precisely the starting point for the discussion of uh, a scalar symmetry of a scalar uh, or system, a system of scalar fields that may or may not show the same phenomenon that you have already encountered here. And now let's go in two steps here. So let's find the direct 
ana analogous of what we have introduced here, which is the one for n equal 1, so when we have just one scalar field, a system like this one, if we have n element in this vector, we'll have a symmetry O n, right? You can rotate this object at the Lagrangian level when I write it like this. But let's make it really, 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 really trivial. So let's start with n equal 1. N equal 1 is going to be precisely the case that we have over here. So if we start with n equal 1, the Lagrangian is just the same that I wrote here, except that the phi vector becomes just a phi. It's just one object. I don't have an index i attached to it. It's just one object. <coughs> the Lagrangian is exactly the one I've written over there. And it goes exactly in parallel with what I have here on the blackboard. So if I pick, a sign, if I pick a, the sign for the mu square minus, as I've written over there, I would have the situation of the symmetric potential that we have chosen over here. If I pick a sign that is opposite to this one, so if I write the Lagrangian like this, so if I pick a sign mu square that is bigger than zero, I have something that looks precisely like what I had there. And if I pick something that has a mu square smaller than zero, as analogous to say I write this term as plus a half mu square phi square with mu square bigger than zero, it's just to use just one mu square and one expression for the Lagrangian, <coughs> that what we see is precisely what we had already seen before. So we see something that now behave like this, where this is our phi, and this is our V of phi. And now we have a two minima in our potential, and the system that we are studying, the system of field, will have to choose in the vicinity of which minimum of uh, our, our, our field theory, so in the, in the vicinity of which vacuum of our theory, as a matter of fact, uh, he would like to leave, uh, if here or there. Right. But because we have n equal 1, uh, we have just uh, a double degeneracy of these objects. So we can be either, so we have a discrete, uh, a twofold possibility. Either it's plus phi 0 or minus phi 0 the place, uh, the point uh, that will minimize uh, the potential of our, uh, of our theory. Now, <coughs> it is also interesting to notice uh, that uh, when you write uh, the Lagrangian, so we have uh, implicitly written these as a phi zero that is uh, uh, constant, right? So it's a value. Now, why are we doing this? Well, because if you analyze the Lagrangian that you have over here, this term that is a four derivative square uh, splits into a time-dependent part and a space-dependent part. And the space-dependent part is, is not a potential energy, strictly speaking, but it plays the role of a potential energy. And because of that, uh, in order to really minimize the potential energy, you immediately realize that, that uh, you, better you, you want to have a phi that is not a phi of x, that is a constant that doesn't have a di phi different from zero. Otherwise, you would always have a positive term to be added to your potential. So that's the reason why you pick a constant as a minimum of your, uh, for, uh, to minimize your potential. Now, <coughs> you go to the next step, and there is no point to go much farther than the next step for two reasons, because it's all the same. So the ideas are the same, and uh, it gets very difficult to draw on the blackboard. Right? So, <coughs> so <coughs> if you go to n equal 2, then you have two fields. Let's call them phi 1 and phi 2. You can even decide to switch to a complex representation that is very convenient when you have two field. So you can uh, switch to field, let's say, phi star, that I think we want to normalize, uh, if I remember correctly what I use in my notes, that I then want to refer to in order to, to give you the right factor of 1 and 2. I define as 1 over square, with, I normalize with the 1 over square root of 2 in front to be normalized to 1. So I just define a field phi like this, and the phi star so you switch to a complex representation, it's just the star of the, file that, that, of the field that I have introduced. <coughs> and then you take the, put, so you rewrite your Lagrangian, your Lagrangian now will look like a, a demu phi star demu phi, and then you would have the potential, that let's write it like this, a minus mu star phi star phi, which is precisely the term that we have over there, and then minus lambda phi star phi square. Hmm? And the factor of 2 should be okay if I use the square root of 2 that I have there. So again, for mu square 
bigger than zero, which is case number one, you have the rotation figure of what you have over there. So now to draw, you draw two axes. One is your real part, the other is your imaginary part. And here is your potential that is a function of the complex phi. And now if mu square is bigger than zero, you would have uh, just a rotation figure of the curve that we had on the left hand side. And if mu square is uh, smaller than zero, you have the rotation figure of the other object that I drew over there, or the one dimensional object. It's much more complicated to draw, but uh, more or less uh, it will look like um, the Mexican hat that uh, you know very well. So the zero is here, this guy goes down. You have now the big difference, you have now a degeneracy of minima that I would like to draw like it's really difficult to draw well. But, so you have this circle at the bottom of your Mexican hat that is the degeneracy of minima. And choosing, uh, of course, uh, the field now has a direction because it's a complex field, right? And choosing a point uh, along uh, these, uh, minim these uh, um, degeneracy of minima, so this uh, collection of minima that you have at the bottom of your potential that now is uh, three-dimensional in this, uh, in this uh, um, plot, <coughs> will necessarily break the symmetry that is now a continuum symmetry, right? So if you pick a point here, you pick it with the very same consideration that you used uh, in the n equal one case, so what I said there still holds. But now what you want, uh, what, you know, when, you, when you pick one of the points along uh, this degeneracy of minima, you will have to take into account uh, that you are defining both components of the field, the phi one and the phi two. Now, a really easy way of picking it is just to decide that it's in one direction that is either phi 1 or phi 2. Right? So for instance, you decided that it's in the direction of phi 1, that is all real, it's just the real part. And you take <coughs> in that, uh, uh, for, that, for that particular, for that in, in minimizing the potential, let's see first of all what the condition is. So the potential of your theory is this one. So you are working now with the potential V of phi star phi, which is uh, the mu square phi star phi minus lambda phi star phi square. So you end up, uh, when you impose uh, that, uh, the derivative of your potential so that the v prime is equal to zero, you end up with something that gives you a condition of the form of phi star phi equal to minus mu square over two lambda, right? And this is precisely the equation that defines this line here at the bottom, or whatever variety you have uh, in an n bigger than two dimensional case. Now, <coughs> you give normally a name to this object, so you choose your field, a field phi, so the choice of field phi that you do is a choice of field phi among the many at the bottom of the potential let us satisfy this condition, call it phi zero. One possibility is just to pick a phi zero that has just a real component and is precisely the square root of these objects. So to pick a phi zero, which is minus mu square divided two lambda to the one half. This is a possibility, right? And this is what you call, uh, as a matter of fact, uh, V, the vacuum expectation value of, uh, your, uh, of, uh, of your field. Now, if you do the interesting exercise of working out uh, the physics at this particular point, as you do in this case, and as you do even before that, as you did in that case, is to work out the physics at the minimum. So expand your potential, the derivative term is trivial, right? But expand your potential in the vicinity of the minimum, you will find something very interesting on the spectrum of this object. Because now you have two objects in here, you have two scalar fields. But they are different from what you started from. So you started from a theory that, has a, that had a kinetic term and then two other terms that you cannot really identify because one does, it looks like a mass term but is not. And the other one is just an interaction. So they both look like kind of funny interactions put, put together. But now if you work out the physics of your problem after you have noticed that there is no symmetry till the very end, but that the symmetry is broken on the vacuum of the theory. And therefore you want to go and pick a particular point and see what the spectrum of your theory looks like. So you go to that particular point, which is this one, and you say, well, I expand that, and I now write, uh, and I now write uh, my field phi as the phi zero that I have over there, <coughs> plus a phi prime, right? And the phi prime, I write it as f1, f1 prime plus i f2 prime. So this is your phi of x, of course. So you imagine x 
in here too, and in the two objects that I have introduced. And you now go back to your Lagrangian, the Lagrangian that you have over there. And you rewrite it in terms of the field phi, but written in terms of phi zero and phi prime. Then what you find is something very interesting. So you will find that your Lagrangian becomes a Lagrangian of the form. Of course, there is always the factor of one over square root of two that I used in my normalization over there that explains why I'm now writing a half in front of a kinetic term of fourth of components, you will see that one of the two fields, so let's say the phi 1, because we picked phi 0 in the direction of phi 1, has now a kinetic term and an honest mass term. So a term that looks like <coughs> plus a half mu square phi 1 square. And I don't want to confuse you here. Remember that we are doing the case for mu square negative. So this is the right sign as a klein gordon mass, right? So it's just because mu square is negative. And then <coughs> you will see that the other term, that the mu phi 2, has lost its mass term. It doesn't have a mass, right? So it has only a kinetic term. So one of the two becomes massive, the other is not, right? So the spectrum of your theory just uh, kind of, uh, um, yes? When you say phi 1 and phi 2 are like n different kind of phi's, what does that physically mean? They are just the n component uh, of, of one. Well, they are just it's just a, a theory of n scalar fields. And when you pick one point instead of the other, what does that mean? Like, well, clearly you have to make this you, that point. Uh, the condition now will be a condition uh, similar. Will be a condition not like this written like this is written like this because uh, we were dealing with two. So I switched to the complex representation. Okay. Now, if we deal with n, we will just stay with the n representation. So this condition will become a phi square equal to, where well, phi square means sum over i of phi i square, right, equal to that. And then it means that uh, the choice of phi zero will be just a vector. Phi zero will be a vector, right, of n components. Uh, and uh, you will have to pick one of these vectors. <laughs> Well, I would say nature decide, but we need to figure out what it did, right? So, okay. So, but uh, as a matter of fact, uh, the point is just that uh, um, it's not so crucial. I mean, the fact that we have picked it this way is just because it's very convenient to do calculations that way. In particular, when you go, for instance, we'll see also in the case of the standard model, we pick a very particular vacuum expectation value because we want to do the calculations in the easiest possible way, but it doesn't have to depend on that, right? So, <coughs> so this is the kind of situation that you see. And it's even, even more, plus other terms, of course, it doesn't end here. It keeps going with terms that are a mixture of phi 1 and phi 2 and represent the interactions between phi 1 and phi 2. Now, there is another way of seeing the very same thing in a very uh, obvious way. So there is a representation of the field that is even better and is suggested by the fact uh, that we are, uh, it's, it's suggested in this case by the fact that if we are using a complex notation to represent your field phi instead of with the real and an imaginary part with the modulus and a phase, so with the magnitude and a phase. So if you represent your field phi of x over there instead as phi 1 plus i phi 2, you write it as a rho of x times e to the i theta of x modulus normalization that you put inside that you have to do in order for the dimensions of these things to be fine. And you write the Lagrangian in this way and you write the minimization condition not in terms of phi but in terms of rho and theta, what do you expect it to be? It will be rho equal to a certain rho zero, right? Because what is this fixing? It's fixing the radius of this circle, right? It tells you phi star phi equal to a given fixed value. That means the radius of the circle equal to the square root of phi star phi. So if I introduce a rho, the minimization condition will be just fixing a point along that, uh, uh, that, um, that circle and uh, what you will see and theta of x is precisely the phase that goes around, right? So what you will see at this, in, uh, in rewriting the Lagrangian in terms of rho and theta, you will see that you will get these two terms of rho, and uh, the theta, the phase theta is basically gone from, the, from your representative. So it's not a degree of freedom of your theory, of your physical anymore. So now, this said, step number two, big step. Or step so these are many little steps, always uh, within a purely scalar theory, right? And the starting, okay, the, the starting from classical mechanics was just to, to familiarize it with the idea and show how far back that it goes. Now, <coughs> the really next important step that we want to do is just to gauge this theory, so big step. We're still talking about a classical theory, right? So we haven't mentioned quantum yet. We haven't done a quantum field theory yet. We're still talking about a classical theory, but still uh, we can build a classical gauge theory, 
right? So it's exactly so. It, in a way, it's, it goes the other way around uh, in real life. So what do, what we do what we what we do is just that we have a gauge theory and we think that it is, uh, this, the gauge theme is spontaneously broken, and therefore we introduce a scalar Lagrangian such and such. But since we are coming from a scalar Lagrangian here, you can also think of two do the same kind of exercise you do when you start from the Lagrangian that has only fermions uh, and you want to now to impose a local symmetry on that, uh, on that Lagrangian. The same thing you can do with the Lagrangian that has only scalars. So you impose now, let's say, <coughs> you have a, your field of phi of x uh, with the Lagrangian that we had on the blackboard before and you impose now that it has a, a continuum, that it has a, a local symmetry, so like a U1 symmetry. So you want your Lagrangian to be symmetric under something that is phi of x uh, goes into e to the i alpha x phi of x. Now you need the same Lagrangian that I had over there, the Lagrangian, the mu phi star, the mu phi, etc. Cetera, et cetera. So you, knew what, you know what you have to do in order to write the Lagrangian that indeed has this symmetry with the local phase, the phase alpha, you have to bring in vector fields, and etc. Cetera, et cetera. So you have to, in, to really build the gauge theory. Now, <coughs> let's start with the gauge theory that is the simplest possible one. So with the symmetry that is really the one that you have here, you want symmetry, so an abelian gauge symmetry, right? So let's start with an abelian, therefore, um, young mill theory. So the Lagrangian that we would write down, we know that we introduce fields, one field, a mu of x, and this field, a mu of x, will transform under our abelian gauge symmetry as a mu of x plus, <coughs> sorry, 1 over g, the mu, sorry, alpha of x, right? So this is the kind of transformation that we have. The Lagrangian that is invariant under this gauge transformation is the one that we know is made of two terms, one for the gauge fields, one for the scalar fields, and is of the form of minus 1 fourth f mu nu, f mu nu, where f mu nu is the strength tensor for an abelian theory, so the mu a nu minus the mu a mu, and then uh, it has the piece that uh, belongs to the scale, nothing else for the gauge fields, and it has a piece that belongs to the L5, which is precisely the one that we have out there. So I want to rewrite it. But, no, I will rewrite it because there is a big difference. And the big difference is just that now this term is, the potential is really the same, but of course the kinetic term has been modified to now include the covariant derivative, the mu, which is the, the mu, the traditional, the usual uh, standard derivatives, uh, then minus ig a mu. And I hope I'm getting all the signs right. We, we'll see in a second. Let me finish by writing the other two terms that are over there, that are uh, the term with the wrong mass sign, and we will work, of course, by now under the condition mu squared smaller than zero, and then the term that belongs to the potential that we want to study because the, it has a, this property of broking, breaking the symmetry on the vacuum. Now, why this theory is so much more interesting than just the one that we have there on top? Well, it is uh, because, as you know, and now things probably either are already very clear or are coming back to your mind, uh, what this theory actually describes uh, is not the theory of a massless vector boson, as uh, it looks like, because there is no mass term in here for this this theory. And the reason is uh, because it wouldn't be symmetric. So if I had to put an explicit mass term in here, I would break the gauge symmetry explicitly in the Lagrangian. And then yes, of course, we can always do that, uh, but it's less interesting, right? So meaning that if you say, well, uh, as soon as uh, I, I see that something has a mass, I put in an explicit uh, breaking term in the Lagrangian, you lose the nice fact uh, that your theory has a gauge symmetry, and you lose a lot. Right? So in, in all the impact that these particular properties has on the physics of the problem, on top of the fact that, that you, know, <coughs> you may be constrained by the fact that you see conservation of certain charges and certain things that they need to be represented and enforced through a gauge symmetry. So you may need to have that gauge symmetry and not be able to put a master in the, in the Lagrange. But your vector boson, so your vector particle may be massive, example, the weak interactions, right? So what do you do? Well, this is precisely what, uh, the, uh, what we now can honestly call the Higgs mechanism does for you, because this is the first representation of a Higgs mechanism and the first realization of a Higgs mechanism for a theory that has a very simple symmetry that is an abelian symmetry. And this is uh, the state when the Higgs mechanism was being proposed. 
1964. Right? So if you read the papers, uh, some of them have precisely these uh, implementation. Very simple idea, but uh, that comes from not just from high energy physics, from a lot of other fields, but uh, brilliant intuition to see how you can get uh, a vector, a massive vector bosons without having an explicit uh, breaking term in the Lagrange. Okay, so should we look at, <coughs> it's easy to convince ourselves that this is the case, and we can do it uh, just doing the little calculation on the blackboard. And let's do it in this case, uh, so that when we get to the next step, which is the non-abelian step, we will always point to the differences, but we will not get lost into all the different indices and calculations. So, <coughs> set aside the kinetic term of the uh, vector fields and co focus on this part here, so on the part that contains uh, just the scalar field, you immediately see the difference, and the difference is just that now you have a minimal coupling uh, between uh, the scalar fields uh, and the vector fields. And because of the minimal couplings between the two, you have terms in here that are of the form A phi A phi, okay? Now, that would be a honest interaction between the two, but that if you now think of uh, what is happening uh, on the scalar side as far as the potential goes, so if you now think of the fact that the theory now is settling down in a given minimum of the potential, and settling down in the given minimum of the potential means that you choose a given minimum there, so a given particular value of <coughs> the field at the minimum, and you shift to expand your theory in the vicinity of the minimum, and et cetera, et cetera. So what you see is just that uh, in this particular term that looks like um, in the part uh, of the derivatives that contains A, so that looks like plus IG A mu phi star on this side, and uh, minus IG A mu phi on this side, by the time this phi goes to phi zero, so it goes to a constant uh, at the minimum, uh, here you get a term uh, that has a two A fields uh, times constant. And the constants, uh, that term, uh, therefore, looks really like uh, a mass term for the A mu field, uh, so it looks like a constant uh, times A mu A mu, where the constant is the mass of the A mu field. And the constant that comes out of here, if all the factors of two and et cetera are right, uh, should be of the form uh, G square, uh, and then uh, what we have over there. So the <coughs> V square, and I would say, I think that to get things right, uh, I should call this. And A mu, A mu. And therefore, this object here is MA square equal to G times V. So the big novelty of uh, a model in which we have uh, gauged, we have imposed the local symmetry on the five fields, and that has brought in a vector field that, that looks initially like a massless field, uh, is that indeed uh, these Lagrangian is hiding the physics of the massive vector field, and uh, on top of that, uh, we will, if we keep going in, in expanding our Lagrangian, we will see what we have seen before. So we will see that among the two scalar degrees of freedom, there will be one that is massive, and there will be another one that it is massless. And actually, the other one that is massless is very, the physics of that guy, in now that we, ex that we have developed this new theory with uh, a gauge symmetry, is very, very, very much attached to, to the physics of the new degrees of freedom that uh, having a massive vector field is brought in. We go from a massless object uh, up here to a massive object uh, down here, and uh, it's not the same. I mean, it's not just adding a mass. It's adding degrees of freedom, one degree of freedom, because we go from a transverse object that has two transverse degrees of freedom to a, a, a massive object that has two transverse and one longitudinal degrees of freedom. So this object is fundamentally different. So the degree of freedom that we seem to have lost up there, this phi 2, is actually reappeared here. So if you keep expanding the entire Lagrange, so if you now patiently, and I invite you to do that as a sort of, of exercise on the side if you haven't done that at least once in your life. So if you do this exercise of just the doing, uh, assuming that particular choice of vacuum and expanding about uh, the vacuum in this Lagrangian, uh, you will see that uh, apart from the term that we just uh, wrote down explicitly, so these two terms here, you would have also terms in here that are precisely the one that we have, that we have up there. And you would have a term, interesting term, that just couple over here, the phi 2 and the A. 
They're very interesting, and the reason why they're very interesting, so you have terms that are apart from constant, uh, that contains G and B, etc. You have terms that are of the form A mu, <coughs> sorry, the mu phi 2 with some constant in front. Right? And these are, are really terms that tells you that the two are intimately coupling. And the reason for that, uh, that is the fact that uh, when you now set out to calculate uh, the two-point correlation function for the mu, which is the propagator of the mu field, these objects will contribute. And they will contribute in such a way that they will modify the propagator from the propagator of a massless vector boson to the propagator of a massive vector boson. It's kind of very neat to see that happening. So, because you see how this is, the, what, what this object will look like a level of final rules. It will be something that will look like, imagine to put this into the correlation function of an A mu, so this object here will produce a term, uh, you need two of them, uh, because there are only an A mu in here, so you need the two of them. It will look like a K mu, K nu, because you have this derivative, the mu in here, divided as something that depends on what you factor out in front, right? And typically, we modify the propagator precisely to the form minus i, let's say, k squared minus m a squared times uh, g mu nu minus k mu k mu over m a squared. You can try to do this exercise too once you have got the Lagrangian in this form. So many big things are happening uh, in this, uh, in the simplest possible realization, but the true realization of the Higgs mechanisms. The, the vector boson becomes massive, and uh, the degrees of freedom, the scalar degrees of freedom that disappear from, out, that meaning disappear physically from the spectrum, uh, is reabsorbed, and it's the meaning of eaten up uh, sometimes uh, that, you, that you hear, by the vector boson that becomes massive and acquires one degree of freedom, the longitudinal degrees of freedom. So we start with two scalar and two vector degrees of freedom, and we end up with one scalar and three vector degrees of freedom, and you see it in all the little details of the theory. So no matter what you work out, you see how all the little pieces come together to produce that. And I gave you the example of the propagator. Yes? Is that a denominator? Is it m a squared or k squared? It's m a squared in that case. Sometimes it says k squared. Yeah, it's but... In the unit of mm -hmm. <coughs> so, um, now, the next step that we want to take, now that this has been, uh, has been kind of uh, um, ironed out, is uh, to move towards the standard model. That's what I, I would like to do. And to move towards the standard model, the step is very easy because the only thing that we need to do is just to go from an abelian theory to a non-abelian theory. Now, typically, as I was saying at the beginning, what you do is uh, the other way around. So you start uh, with the vector theory, with the gauge theory, with the young mill theory like this one, and you add this piece uh, in order to break the symmetry spontaneously, which is precisely what is done in the standard model. I did it the other way around because it, it's constructively more intuitive. Now, if we want now to go from uh, this theory to a theory that uh, is uh, non-abelian, well, the thing that will change, uh, and now let me just no, I cannot hold it up. Okay, so I will do it here. So I, will, I have to erase, but I will modify things in such a way that it comes out exactly the same thing. So let me see if I can just use the same line and just modify by adding uh, and changing the transformations uh, that I need. So now what do we want to do is just here to have a a generic, let's say, SUN kind of transformation. So the transformation, the, exp the transformation here will have uh, the linear combination of alpha ATA in the, in, the, in the exponent for a generic final transformation. If I want to write it in infinitesimal form, I will write these, uh, <coughs> sorry, simply as 1 plus I alpha ATA phi of X, where this is TA are the generators uh, of uh, the Lie algebra of the group uh, of my non-abelian group that uh, you can imagine as, as an SUA. Phi I can be, a phi of X can be a phi of X, or it can be a phi sub I of X, it's exactly the same thing. We can work with one, we can work with the vector, it's exactly the same thing. Now, the A mu of X, so of course, uh, a, a mu now, <coughs> sorry, will have a um, group index attached to it. So it will be an A, A mu, right? <coughs> so let me put the mu down here. So it will go in A, A mu, 
And then here you have the same term that you had in the non-abelian case, just uh, we attach an index A to the coefficient alpha, because now you have many of them. And of course I haven't written it here, but this is an alpha A of X. And then you have a new term, <coughs> which is the one that contains the structure constant of the group uh, that I will write and I will define in a second, and uh, has here an A mu B of X, uh, alpha C of X. And the TA, are de the F, A, B, C are defined uh, by the algebra of the symmetry group. Okay. So when we come down here, we will have this term that now becomes that. And uh, the only thing that we need to change uh, is the covariant derivative, <coughs> sorry, the mu. So you will change it to something that looks now a mu a t a, okay? Now you do exactly the same. So again, the origin of the mass term is precisely in here. So the origin of the mass term comes precisely from the terms that we had before. And now it will look like, so when I use the part of the Lagrangian like that depends on the scalar field exactly as we did before, I will end up with the many other terms, kinetic terms before, interaction term after. And here in the middle, I will have something that looks like, now, because the coupling is of the form G, A mu A, T A, phi. On the other side, we will have G, A mu B, T B, phi, because we have two sums. And so over, this is the kind of term uh, that we end up having in A mu A, A mu B, right? Exactly analogous of what we had before uh, if you drop the group matrices and if you d drop the group indices. Now, of course, it's more complicated. Uh, so you see what, is, what happens. When you now specify the Lagrangian to the minimum, so when you expand your Lagrangian at the minimum, one of the terms uh, that will come in, uh, there will be terms that are the interaction between the phi, the, the phi primes, if you want, uh, and the A field. But there will be a term that is exactly as before, with this is phi zero. Now, is phi zero can be interpreted as before, can be a more complicated phi zero if you go to a phi n theory. But it's exactly the same thing. So you will go from here, upon let's say phi specified to the minimum, you will go to a term, you will obtain from here a term that is of the form TA phi zero, and now I drop the star because my choice of phi zero is real, right? And then I have TB of phi zero, and then A mu A, A mu B. And I leave it written like this because in a generic theory with uh, phi multiplets of some symmetry, this phi zero can be a vector with many components in that particular theory. And therefore the TA the matrices will act on those vectors moving around the components. So it's a matrix vector kind of operation that you have over here, as we will see in the case of the standard model. So this is clearly a term that is, uh, as it is here, non-diagonal in A and B, in the group indices, because I have A and different from B in general. So it's clearly of the form of a mass term. So I can define here what I would call a mass matrix, M square of AB. And you see what is going to happen uh, by diagonalization of this matrix. You will find that the linear combinations of the field A mu, A, right, uh, that are the ones that belong to each eigenvalue of this matrix. So there will be a number of, how many, right? Well, will be, you see what is happening here. The TA generators are acting on the vacuum expectation value of the field, right? So there will be mass terms only for those uh, T, such for, for every time TA phi zero is known zero. Because as soon as you have a TA phi zero that is zero, the corresponding entry in the matrix is zero. Right? And this is precisely what we say, that uh, we will get a mass vector boson uh, for each generator of the symmetry that is broken on the vacuum. Okay? And we already know that for each such thing, when that, that for each one of them, there will be a massless uh, scalar on the other side uh, that will be reabsorbed into the dynamic uh, of uh, a massive vector field uh, on this side. So it's exactly what we saw in the, in the abelian case, uh, just complicated by the fact that you have many, and therefore having many, you need uh, necessarily to probably, you won't have, a, 
immediately a diagonal matrix of uh, vector, massive vector boson, but you will have a matrix that you have to diagonalize in order to find the eigenstate, the mass eigenstates of your theory. So the AMU appearing in the Lagrangian here are current eigenstates, and these are what you need to find are the mass eigenstates of these level. Okay, so <coughs> this is precisely what uh, we want to now to translate uh, into the standard model. But there is still one important consideration that you want to make here. At this, till now, at this point, till uh, for the entire discussion that we have carried through till now, we have only dealt, uh, and we have used nowhere, the fact that our theory was a quantum theory. We have always, uh, it could be a classical field theory, it would be everything we said uh, would stay through. So how do we handle the same discussion in a quantum theory, so in a quantum field theory? Does, it, does everything stay the same? So basically the question is, uh, what do quantum fluctuations do to this feature? Do they mess up completely everything? Uh, can we still treat the potential the way we did and minimize the potential the way we did? Can we define an object uh, that set things so clearly into place uh, as the potential does uh, for a classical theory such that uh, minimizing the potential we find uh, the vacuum expectation value of our state, of our, <coughs> sorry, of our field, so the minimum of the of, uh, configuration for the fields that we're using. And in that particular, when we specify the discussion to a particular choice of our configuration, we can expand our theory and find the physical spectrum. Does it still everything hold that way? Well, it does, uh, although the situation is, of course, more complicated. Uh, and you have to use the right tools in order to be able to continue your extension uh, step by step from the simple one-dimensional classical case uh, up to the quantum field theory case. So you just have to go back to what you use uh, for quantizing your theory. And the simplest way of looking uh, at the problem and of uh, discussing the problem, understanding the problem, uh, is uh, to use a path integral quantization and to use uh, the different uh, generators uh, of uh, the uh, quantization of your theory. So the different generators uh, of the correlation functions of your theory to define uh, the object that you really need. So among the many one that you have, the one that really you use in order to define, the, to describe uh, the spontaneous symmetry breaking uh, of a quantum field theory is what is called the effective action. Mm -hmm. So just to, to remind, I mean, all of you know about it, but just to remind, and have heard about it, but just to remind you what, you, what, what we're talking about, <coughs> this is just in a nutshell, because it's a, uh, as you may imagine, the, re of the result is, is uh, amazingly simple, right? but to get to the result is not so straightforward. And it's really beautiful at the same time because of the simplicity of the result. And there you, can, you can read about all the details and all the different steps in many different textbooks, because of course it's textbook material. Uh, Paskin book, for instance, has nice chapters on this uh, uh, that goes into the, start with the renormalization of, the th of, the, of a theory that has a spontaneous symmetry breaking, so of a spontaneous, spontaneously symmetry broken theory. And then goes on uh, to the definition of uh, the realization of the spontaneous symmetry in the case uh, of uh, uh, a quantum theory. So <coughs> basically, what you, what you do is just uh, to remind them what, you're to what we're talking about. So if you quantize our theory with a generating function of z, that is uh, related to, to the generator of uh, the connected correlation the, of the <coughs> connected correlation function w of j simply by e to the i w j. So just to define my symbols, right? Because different mm, contexts use different symbols. And what this is is what we all know, right? So it's the integral. Let's take a scalar theory just to be to fix the idea of this in the presence of a source. Uh, this is how we quantize our theory with this generating function. Now. The reason we know that uh, the equivalent of, uh, if you want, uh, if the, the equivalent of the minimum of the potential that we have over there will be the value of our field uh, on the vacuum, right? So the vacuum expectation value. And that object is very easily defined in terms of these functionals. In particular, I can define <coughs> this object phi of C phi sub c of x, and the reason why of the c, I'll say in a second, uh, as uh, the vacuum expectation value of the field phi, which is nothing else than the derivative of wj with respect to j. 
right? And now, why, why this is labeled though with a different, I, why do, I, I do not call it phi of x, it's just because it's not the phi that appears here, it is the vacuum expectation value of that phi. That's the difference. Now, it is customary to introduce the effective action no? as just the Legendre transform of this W of j. And let me write it first, uh, and then uh, we will see what this means. From the relation uh, that you have over here, you can define, uh, you can, let me first uh, write it, and then uh, we'll discuss uh, what this use is. Uh, is first of all, I write it as a function of phi of c, and I'll explain this in a second. And this will be given as uh, w of j minus the integral over d for x of j of x and phi sub c of x. So if you look at uh, this object, uh, this object, uh, and this object, you will see why this is the Legendre transform of w of j, because it's just defined that way. So w is a function of j, gamma is a function of phi sub c, and phi sub c is defined precisely as the derivative of w, of course all in a functional formalism, because that's what we're doing, right? That is defined precisely like this, and it, re it reminds you very much uh, of relations in thermodynamics or statistical mechanics, uh, be, I don't know, between free energy and energy, for instance, right? So the energy, the free energy is a function of T, the energy is a function of S, uh, and indeed, uh, the derivative of f with this to t give you s, and the derivative of, f, of um, e with this to s give you t. Right? So that's, that's precisely the same thing in this case. Well, why this object is so important? You know that this object can be calculated, and this object is a function of phi of c, so it's a function of the fields. Why? Because you use the relation that we wrote here above to derive j as a function of phi of c, and you plug it into here to obtain a gamma of phi of c as a function just of phi of c. So I can write it as an expansion in the phi's and its derivatives. And if I so do, that's the definition of the effective potential. The definition of the effective potential is precisely <coughs> when I rewrite the effective action that I have here as the <coughs> integral over d for x of something that is minus the effective potential of phi of c plus, let me call them globally as derivative terms. Okay? So V effective, what we define as effective potential is the potential part of gamma effective defined as the one that contains the powers of the field as opposed to the derivatives. And you can show these are objects uh, can be calculated uh, with the uh, functional integral methods, uh, right? Uh, and you can show that V effective uh, is indeed uh, as uh, the effective action uh, starts with the classical actions plus loop corrections. Uh, the effective starts precisely with the classical potential plus loop corrections. So the classical potential that we have used up to here stays at the quantum theory in this particular position as the first term in the expansion of the effective potential that where the effective potential is uh, the phi dependent part of the effective action that when expanded in loop also is, is written as a, the, the classical action plus loop corrections. The interesting thing is that if you carry through the Legendre transform that we use to define gamma, there is one more property that you can write down. When two objects, W and gamma, are related by Legendre transform, this relation is true. So, so the derivative of one with respect to its, depend, it, its own dependence, J, gives you the variable from which the other one depends, and vice versa. And indeed, if you calculate the derivative of gamma effective with respect to phi C, you get J, what is the sign? So W and gamma effective uh, are related one to the other by Legendre transformation. And this means that this relation is true, so that phi c is defined as delta wj with this to j. And at the same time, j is the derivative of gamma effective with this to phi c modulus a sign, with a sign in front. And this is the very important relation. Because the derivative, because of our expansion and the definition of the effective potential, the derivative of gamma effective with this to phi c is indeed the derivative of V effective with this to phi c. Because the rest has derivatives of phi c. And the minus sign uh, just compensates the minus sign that we have here. So this indeed uh, is uh, 
the derivative of the effective potential with this P2 phi C. So in the absence of a source term, so when J is equal to zero, this gives you just the minimization condition, this gives you the stable conditions, uh, the stable configuration of your system, because that is, this is precise v, v prime of effective, it's the derivative of the effective potential. Okay? So <coughs> this is precisely what makes the connection between the classical situation that we have seen here, where the stable configurations were the one that would correspond to the minimum of the potential, and the stable configuration in a quantum field theory where the, that correspond precisely to the minima of the effective potential in this case. The effective potential can be calculated, as we just said, and the calculation now would just uh, how, how, so will it change, let's, let's read them this way, will it change what all the relations that we have seen up to now? The relation that we have seen up to now is relation between mu, lambda, and the parameters of the theory. For instance, mu, lambda, and the masses. Will it change it? Well, here is where uh, the presence of the symmetry is extremely helpful. And it's uh, actually amazing how simple it is to describe in spite of the fact that uh, you don't know it a priori. So what is, in, in, in what is extremely important uh, is just that uh, you always think, uh, so, so what do you expect? You expect uh, that uh, when you, something is written as an order zero term of cross loop correction, uh, who knows what happens uh, to this object uh, when the whole theory that you are considering goes through, for instance, the renormalization process, right? So all the relations that we have seen up to now could all be messed up. But that doesn't happen, no matter how complicated the theory is, uh, because uh, the Lagrangian you start from is always this one. So the Lagrangian you start from doesn't have many parameters. It has mu and it has lambda, and of course it has the fields inside. So the renormalization of this theory will have to boil down by the end to renormalization of mu, renormalization of lambda, and of the fields that are here. So even after you expand your theory, in the vicinity of the vacuum that you have chosen. And the spectrum has shown up. And you have seen, uh, maybe in a complicated case, that you have a bunch of massive vector fields with their own masses. Still, all those masses are related because they will all be functions of mu and lambda. There is no way out. They have to come from there. So at the end, uh, indeed, all the relations that you find at order zero, they are still true, provided you use a renormalization mu and a renormalization, and a, a renormalized mu and a renormalized lambda. So this is the beauty of, the, of having the symmetry. This is the beauty of saying, uh, well, why don't we put in uh, an explicit breaking in our Lagrangian? Because having symmetries is a nice thing. And you see it precisely here. So we can continue. The reason why many, many times uh, the problem of, Higgs, uh, of the Higgs mechanism is discussed directly in the standard model without even mentioning that there is a quantum field theory. And it's treated just, uh, they tell you this, they show you how, what happens when you pair it to a vector field through a gauge symmetry, so when you consider a local symmetry, and then the discussion go on directly to the Higgs uh, spectrum, right? And the reason for that is just because all the relations that you use are basically true, right? Uh, modulus corrections that we will actually discuss, but they are corrections that boil down to correction of the parameters of these Lagrange. Like, so nothing that we will say is not correct if we just keep using mu and lambda the way we have seen there. And I invite you to read through the details of the renormalization of a, of a theory with symmetry breaking because it's really, really a neat chapter. Okay, so now I need, uh, let's see, I can now modify, what I want to do is just to spe specialize now the discussion to the case of the standard model and uh, look at uh, at least one plot today. Right, which is the one of the branching ratios for, the, for, the, for Higgs decays, because it's the most natural one that comes out from this discussion. <coughs> so, let me see if we can do that. Um, let me see if we can do that uh, without erasing what we have here on the blackboard. I think we can. So, all of you know the standard model, I think. So, I don't have to write down the Lagrangian of the standard model otherwise it would take the rest of the time. So let me just uh, specify our discussion by changing uh, what we are interested in is just uh, the scalar part of it plus the coupling of the scalar with the vectors. That's the only part we are interested in. So what I want to do is just to change the covariant derivative. So imagine that this is it. Right? So this, this is your Lagrangian of the standard model. What we have to, of course, uh, this is not the symmetry that we have. The symmetry that we are considering now is the symmetry that is uh, SU2 left across U1. 
So SU2 of weak laser spin and U1 of hypercharge. Hmm? The field five that we are considering is a very special field. So all these needs to be specified to the right symmetry, right? But where am I going to put the details? I'm going to put the details uh, in the form of the covariant derivative because this is important to see the fields that we have in there. And I'm going to put more details in the form of phi. So which kind of phi is it chosen in particular in the standard model to implement uh, the Higgs mechanism as we have seen now in the standard model. So the field phi that is chosen, let's start with the field phi. So the field phi that is chosen is a, a particular object. So it has to be, it has to have quantum number of the quantum group that we are considering. So it has to have the gauge number of the gauge group that we are considering. So it has to be a doublet of SU2 and it has to have some hypercharge. So this object here, this phi, is a doublet of this form, <coughs> sorry, phi plus phi zero, or if you want to call it just phi, it's okay. Let's call it phi zero. Each one of which is complex. So we have four scalar components in the game because each field is a complex field and it has an hypercharger of one half if you calculate. It doesn't have to be fundamental, right? You can show that if you have three component scalar, you can pass it through symmetric breaking. Oh, you mean that it doesn't have to have this form? I'm just. Well, I'm just talking about the one that is used in the standard model. Then, then yes, it can be more. You can you can have a, I mean, a, a, a scalar sector that is a generalization of what is in the standard model. But I'm just speciali specializing the discussion to that. Now, here, when we get to to the um, to the uh, covariant derivative, uh, um, let's call them still a. Yeah, I've called them a here. So. I would just call, I would just write it that we, we need two coupling, we need two terms because you have an SU2 and a U1. So you need a, something that still look like a mu a t a, where the t a, now they have the t a of SU2. So let's write them as, let's say tau a, where the tau a are the Pauli matrices normalized by factor of two normally. And then we have another term that will have a G prime and this is the one for the hypercharger. Let's make explicit the hypercharger uh, quantum number that we have over here. Uh, let's call the field uh, associated to it B mu with a lower index because uh, my quantum derivative has a lower index. So if we now specify, so A in this case, uh, it says U2, so A goes from one to three. So we have four fields, three A's and one B, okay? So when we come to this point, uh, these will look uh, like the following. So <coughs> you will have two terms, uh, one with G and one with, so it's a linear combination of two terms in each case. So instead of having this uh, uh, relatively simple form, uh, and here we see the fact that the phi is uh, a doublet. First of all, we need to specify in general we will have a phi on which uh, these object, these matrices uh, apply to the left and a phi on which these matrices apply to the right because we have two of such terms, a mu here and a mu there. But let's already write uh, directly the one after the choice uh, of uh, the vacuum expectation value of the field. So our phi zero with this theory will be of the following form. It will be a one V, so we, we put if I zero, sorry, zero V, and we normalize it uh, with a one over square root of two to do the same that we did up there. So our V is exactly the same uh, that we have over there, so V over square root of two is minus V square over two lambda. So let's skip directly to the last line that we had on the blackboard here. On the blackboard here, we had first the one with phi and then the one with phi zero. So let's skip directly to the one with phi zero. So because what we, are, what we are getting now is something that looks like zero V on this side with a constant in front. Uh, this is the dagger, right? So this, of course, this object here now will have a, to become a dagger. This is the dagger and this is the dagger. Okay. So this is uh, the V, zero, the V, so the phi zero of the dagger field. And uh, it's attached to something that looks uh, as far as uh, the terms uh, that contain the field. So these two terms uh, that we have over there, it looks like G, A mu A, <coughs> sorry, <coughs> sigma A plus G prime. 
And then uh, I've already used the fact that the sigma A um, as a factor of one half. Where did I write it? It was here on the blackboard. It's gone. Oh, no, here. You see, the sigma A has this factor of one half. And Y for the phi field is one half. This has come out, will come out here with a factor of one fourth for both of them because I have two parentheses. And there will be an extra factor of a half that comes from uh, uh, I don't remember now, but I think it, it, it's one eighth. In any case, that is a factor that is out in front. Thank you, thank you. That's where it comes from. Thank you. Because there is a square root of two for this one and the other one. So this is g on this side, a mu b, sigma b, and then plus g prime b mu, and then 0 v on the other side. So this is uh, the term where the masses of the w and the z are going to come from. How? We'll see it in a second. So now you see the four objects there. And if you now patiently take uh, the sigma matrices uh, and plug them in there and do the little 2 to 2 algebra that comes uh, from this little line, you will see that this expression becomes uh, 1 over 8. And then you will have the following uh, form. V square, actually, let's write the 1 over 8 as 1 half 1 over V square over 4, so it, because the 1 half of the mass term, so it looks nice. And then you will have something that looks like a G square A1 mu square plus G square A2 mu square. And then you would have something that looks like minus G A mu 3 plus G prime B mu square. Okay, and now you see, this is the famous matrix that needs to be diagonalized, right? And now you see how. So because out of here, you see that clearly the A1 and A2 is very easy to, is a very easy job to do because they have the same coupling out in front. And for the other two, you just need to play around a little bit more with the rotation angle between the two, which is the minor angle, actually. And what you get is just that there are four mass eigenstates the w, what we call the w mu plus and minus, that is 1 over square root of 2 of a1 mu, <coughs> sorry, <coughs> plus or minus a2 mu. And the mass of this object, mw, we can read it from here, it's just here, you see, is g times v divided 2. Because these g square v square over 4 is mw square because we have already factored out the factor of a half. So that's just there, g v over 2. And then you have another two objects that are the diagonalization of the other p's that they don't talk to each other. You see one is a1, a2, the other is a3 and b, right? One that we call the z0 because it's the massive one, and the other one that we can call the a mu, which is uh, the massless one that is indeed the photon, so the, the leftover of a symmetry that spontaneously is broken to, as you know, u1 and the two magnetic. And this object here, the z, will be <coughs> just obtained from a3 uh, mu and b mu as a, a mu 3 with a g minus g prime b mu. And the other one is g prime a mu 3 plus g b mu with a normalization here in front that is just 1 over the square root of the square of the two couplings. And in here, you recognize the definition of the Weinberg, the sine and the cosine of the Weinberg angle, right? So the g over g squared plus g prime squared is the sine of the Weinberg angle. The other is the cosine. And uh, <coughs> that's it, right? So the mass is, uh, for the a is 0. And for the z is just, uh, we can read it from a little bit from what we have here. We have to take away the normalization. And once we take away the normalization, uh, it's just uh, v over 2. So this is uh, what, uh, what we end up uh, uh, finding in the standard model. That looks 
more calculationally more complicated because we, we carry on the calculation till the end, uh, but when you have seen all the steps that we have seen before, it's straightforward. This is precisely the application of the principle that we have seen before. Now, what should you do? Well, you should complete the discussion, right? So, say, yes. Well, because uh, uh, the, the, the difference is, is um, made precisely, but since you want to assign a precise charge to both of them, right, the plus and the minus, and, the, and that's the way of doing it. That's the way of obtaining it. So um, now, what I was saying is just that uh, to get to the end of the story and really get everything that we need, we need uh, so what do we expect? Uh, what do we expect the theory? How do we ex do we expect the theory to uh, what what piece are we still missing? The piece that we are still missing is the scalar part of it. But the scalar part of it we can read uh, from uh, what we have on the blackboard over there when we remember that our phi is a complex doublet. Uh, Right, uh, of this form, uh, and that the vacuum expectation value that uh, we have chosen is this one, so it has this, this direction, and therefore when we expand, uh, we expand in a field, uh, if you want, phi of x, uh, that, is, uh, <coughs> that is of the form that we had on the, on, on, on the blackboard before. So we expand in a field that uh, we'll have uh, uh, in precisely apart, apart from a term that, is, uh, that contains uh, some degrees of freedom in, in the exponent, uh, it will be precisely of the form uh, v plus h of x. With terms here in the exponent uh, that we can indicate uh, as with any name you like, uh, and the matrices that we have used, uh, the sigma a over 2 with an index a, which is the group index, uh, and that we are going uh, precisely to rotate away as we did in the case of the abelian symmetry, using uh, the symmetry of the model itself, so using the gauge symmetry, the SU2 symmetry of the model itself. These k of x are the three fields that are indeed the three scalar fields that disappear from the, from the scalar spectrum, precisely because uh, a mu1, a mu2, and a mu3, or w mu plus and minus and z0 mu becomes massive. So they are quite a longitudinal degrees of freedom. There is only one leftover degree of freedom, which is the age of x. It's, it's exactly as before, when we were looking with a complex field, just one complex field, we would have the radial part of this to stay and the phase part to go. Here we have uh, three phases to go and one radial part to stay, which is the one that we have uh, indicated with the letter age, because suggestively enough, uh, this is indeed the Higgs field. So this is precisely what we are going to study the physics of. So if you now replace this object in the scalar Lagrangian you started from, you get all the couplings. So you get from this part here, from the scalar potential, you get the couplings of the Higgs to itself. From the other part, uh, so from the part of the couples to the vector bosons, you get the couplings uh, of the uh, scalar field to the gauge bosons. And these are the objects uh, that we wanted to uh, conclude with the writing time. So let me just sketch them for you. So let's, uh, we can probably write them here, right? So, from the two terms in, so let me erase uh, just briefly this part here. So from here, we get upon changing it to the minimum, right? We get uh, these kind of couplings. So of the Higgs with itself, three, three point coupling and four point coupling uh, with Feynman rules that are of the form uh, minus three i m Higgs over v and uh, minus three i m Higgs uh, square over v square. And this is an m Higgs square actually. And from this part here, we get uh, <coughs> the coupling with the vector bosons that are again three point coupling and four point couplings uh, that are precisely the ones. Uh, that have the Higgs a couple to, let, let's call them just V mu and V nu, two vector bosons, or two Higgs couple the two, two vector bosons. And again, the Feynman rules that goes with these couplings are such that 
there, I write them completely, but the real point and point that we want to stress uh, is just that uh, they are proportional to the masses of these objects, uh, so the strength uh, goes uh, with the mass uh, of uh, the object to which the Higgs is uh, coupled to, not in a, in, a, in a bizarre way, given that it is precisely the object uh, that has, uh, with its vacuum expectation value, give origin, given origin to those masses. Now, <coughs> before, if we have five more minutes, uh, I just wanted to briefly mention something that we are not going to touch on again. So first of all, there are more couplings. These are the fundamental couplings of the Higgs. There are other couplings uh, that are very fundamental coupling of the Higgs to itself uh, and to the gauge bosons of the theory. That is the core of the theory, the young mill theory that we have looked at. There are two more things that we want to remember. One thing is just that there are other couplings that, as we will see, are very, very important in Higgs physics. And uh, we will, in particular one, uh, we will use it over and over, right? Uh, and we will do a lot of physics with that coupling, which is the coupling of a Higgs to two gluons. And you will say, now you're bringing in QCD and uh, the coupling to the gluons, uh, the Higgs nothing to do with it. Indeed, there is no tree-level coupling uh, of the Higgs to the gluons. But there is a one-loop coupling of the Higgs to the gluon, uh, which is uh, this one, through a loops of fermions uh, that we also haven't brought into our theory yet, but they are there. And you know that they are there in the standard model. And because of the Higgs couples, uh, in particular, two massive objects, uh, we haven't introduced yet the coupling to the fermions, uh, but you may imagine, uh, and I'm going to that at, at point two, this is precisely happening through a loop of heavy fermions, and it's very important. It's a very big coupling, as a matter of fact. So not only tree-level vertices are important, uh, there may be loop vertices that are also important. This one is important because it's big. There is another one that is important, actually two more, that is the same, but when you replace the gluons uh, with uh, uh, either the photon or a photon and a Z. Right? So you can have couplings uh, with photons, exactly the same. Or where one of the photons is a Z and the other is a photon. And the, you may be, have these, or you may have one in which inside here you also have uh, gauge bosons. Uh, because uh, the Higgs, as we have seen, they are couples to two weak gauge bosons. Uh, and three weak gauge bosons couple them among themselves. So you can have those two. And those are important uh, phenomenologically sometimes. Uh, so because the Higgs decay into two photons uh, is it's used for phenomenology, yes. This two or this is zero, if you can't write it, it's zero. So, <coughs> now, um, the, other op uh, the other observation that I wanted to make, uh, so this is uh, number one, one loop couplings. Number two, couplings to fermions, okay? Coupling to fermions has nothing to do with the Higgs mechanism. Sometimes the two things are put together, but there's nothing to do with the Higgs mechanism. So that is a really arbitrary part of the standard model that is put in by hand through Yukawa couplings. So the fermions are coupled to the Higgs via Yukawa kind of couplings. And of course, upon symmetry breaking, when the Higgs acquire a vacuum expectation value and we shift to the minimum and the phi becomes phi zero plus phi prime, that phi zero will give mass to the fermions as well, right? Or will induce a mass term for the fermions as well, because of the Yukawa coupling is of the form, <coughs> sorry, phi, psi bar psi, right? So without, without for me to write down the exact Lagrangian with all the indices, uh, let's go to the concept. Uh, the concept is just that the coupling is this one, right? And because of that, uh, you will see that when this becomes a phi zero, you get a psi bar psi term. The couplings in front of it, uh, so this is introduced uh, with a large degree of arbitrariness uh, because each single uh, uh, flavor of fermions will get its own coupling, uh, its own Yukawa coupling, uh, which is completely arbitrary. And it's the weak point. I mean, it's, it's just the weak part of the model itself, one of the weakest, the weakest part of the model itself. And it's definitely something uh, that is common to many other models, but it's one of the, one of really of the, of the uh, red lights that keeps flashing and reminding us that there is something we don't understand there. And if you want to generalize, to generalize the standard model to have a theory behind the standard model, that is a question that you need to answer. Right? But it's not related to the breaking of the symmetry. It's a, it's a, if you want, it's a byproduct of the, of the breaking of the symmetry. So with all this information, 
you can go and calculate the branching ratios of your theory. You sit down, uh, you have the final rules, uh, you, you know how to do things, uh, you know how to calculate the branching ratio. So you can, you can just so calculate the matrix element square of any decay that you want uh, at three level, right? And integrate over phase space and reduce. So if I can just show one plot, uh, I'll leave you with that uh, to think about. So can, can we turn it on just one second and maybe pull down the screen? So this is nothing uh, special. It's just uh, doing that exercise uh, for all the possible decays uh, that you can think of. So you have decays of the Higgs into pair of fermions. Uh, you have decays of the Higgs into pair of gauge bosons, uh, electroweak gauge bosons, decay of the Higgs into two gammas, decay into the, of the Higgs into two gluons. Right? And you see these represented uh, on uh, the mass range that uh, we normally consider between 100 and 1,000. Right? Uh, 100 is below even the experimental limit, uh, and 1,000 is as as much as we would explore, right? So you see, first of all, a big difference between a light Higgs and a heavy Higgs. And we'll comment about this uh, in the next lecture. So maybe they're already thinking, but I know that it's light and blah, 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 blah. Why is she showing me also the, the range up to 1,000? We'll discuss all this. But if you do just the exercise of computing and putting in the value of the max x, and you run it from 100 to 1,000, this is the kind of uh, plot that you should get. And you can stare at this plot and, of course, uh, go from the left to the right where you see the width and justify to yourself why the width behaves the way it behaves, so it grows, right, because of the opening of more and more channels to that, to the point that here we have a very narrow width, very nice peak, it was even below, it's, it's so small sometimes that it's even below the experimental resolution, and then it go up to become a broad resonance, to the point that by the time you get to 1 TV, the width is almost the same as the mass. As you see, it's almost 1,000 GV, the width itself, right? But the other thing that I want you to, um, so you may, you may be there, just you may do the exercise of, so do you have to compute it by hand? Not necessarily, right? So you can uh, make sure to, that you remember how to do it. But then the interesting thing is just that there, are, there is a lot of software out there that can help you with this and do much more than what you can do on a piece of paper. For instance, uh, I don't know if you see this in your tutorial, it will be mentioned to you, there are codes, like there are packages, like uh, one, one that comes to my mind is HDK, for instance, uh, that is specifically for uh, calculating all the decays of the Higgs boson uh, in the standard model, in the MSSM, in many other extensions of the standard model that have scalars. So not only on the standard model Higgs bosons. Now, the question is, if you had to calculate it on a piece of paper, as you would do just with the elements that we have over there, and put it into any code that you like, using the language that you like, right? Uh, just write a little four lines of code that just produce this plot for you. Would you get those curves? The answer is clearly no. Right? So, so if you, they will look like, but the values will look very much off, right? And the reason for, so, no, I'm not saying the reason for that. And then you think of what the reason for that is. That is what is coming in the next transparencies that I had here, but we don't have time to watch that today. It probably is good because you have time to think about it. Okay? So, so you just, and try. I mean, if you, if you know how to use a HDK, for instance, just calculate it on a piece of paper, put in numbers, so the value of M Higgs, the value of the couplings. So use the same on the other side and compare the numbers so, and see the big difference that there is what time of the decay. It takes the decay of the Higgs to blue walls, so, or the decay of, uh, I don't know, the Higgs to BB bar, right? And, uh, and try the numbers and you'll see the big difference that there is in it. And then you ask yourself, why? Right? And we'll discuss that, meaning that this is just to tell you that the story is not over. Now we have introduced the picture. We know what you are talking about. Uh, to do Higgs physics phenomenology, so to do the phenomenology, there is much more to it. That will not change anything on the fundamentals. So we are not going to change anything that we have seen today. But we now have to use the whole full-fledged standard model to really get numbers uh, that are any close to what we can use to compare with collider data or any reliable. 
And this is what we are going to focus on, starting from the decays, that is an easy example, up to production at both the Teraton and the LHC. And one thing that I wanted to do with you was, this, for instance, uh, to get to something like discussing the exclusion limit of the Teraton. Right? So there is a lot of polemic right now on the exclusion limit of the Teraton. Why? Why do, what are the ingredients that come into that? Uh, why, why, why are we discussing it? Uh, and this is a, I mean, understanding something like this, is, it's a starting point. Because then when we get to production, it becomes much more complicated, of course, because you just have to describe a hadronic collision with initial state pattern density and hadronizations and these and that. So let's start understanding these first, OK? OK, so I'll be around in any case. Uh, I'll see you for dinner, I'll see you for breakfast, I'll see you tomorrow. <laughs> okay. Okay.